In Peru, forced sterilization is still leaving a dark shadow in its victims' lives. Will their voices one day be heard? I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C., and this is America's Now. First up, thousands of women in the 1990s coerced into sterilization in Peru. A program to control population and reduce poverty, it was supervised by both doctors and the government. Everyone in the community looks down on us. They think we're corrupted and allowed this to happen. Forcibly sterilized. Correspondent Dan Collins reports from Lima on what is being done to assist victims today. And then children born into Mexico's prison system. They live with their mothers in confinement and even sleep in their cells. Because these children, most of them, have never been outside the, the prison, right? So they've never seen a car, they've never seen a dog, they've never, they've never seen what society is like. We'll introduce you to a woman trying to stimulate their minds and brighten their lives. Meet game changer Saskia Nino de Rivera. And later, the country of Chile has a rich history of producing fine wine. But did you know their principal trading partner is China? Ahora estamos en Maipo. Correspondent Harris Whitbeck visits some of the vineyards sending wine from Chile to China. Welcome to the show. More than 200,000 Peruvian women and men were sterilized during the government of Alberto Fujimori in the 1990s. He's serving 25 years for human rights, crimes and corruption. His daughter Keiko Fujimori narrowly lost Peru's presidential elections in June. But her party will control the country's Congress just as thousands of forced sterilization victims continue the long wait for justice. Correspondent Dan Collins reports from Peru. In the highlands around Peru's one-time Inca capital, Cusco, lies Chumbivilcas. Nestled in the countryside, it feels like time has stood still in this historic Andean town. And for many women of a certain age who live here, so too have their lives. They were sterilized as part of a state program two decades ago. Felicia had just given birth to her fourth child in July 1997. Three days later, she says she was invited to visit the clinic because her baby was unwell. There, she claims she was sterilized against her will. In the Andes, where fertility is prized, the lives of these women have never been the same. Somos mal mirados, nos miran mal. Que las mujeres corrompidas o por corrompirnos nos hemos dejado hacer es cosas, es lo que trata la sociedad, nos miran mal a nosotros, nos humillan y muchas familias se han separado, han roto esa relación, muchas, muchas, porque ha habido esa vez una señora que ha ido a hacerse curar de la gripe, estaba agripadita, ya no la han dejado salir, lo han ligado y se lo ha abandonado su esposo. Ha tenido un segundo compromiso, igualito, es que no puede darle un bebé. According to Peru's health ministry, nearly 350,000 sterilizations were performed on women and more than 20,000 on men between 1993 and 2000. These women are just a handful of those forcibly sterilized in a massive nationwide campaign in the 1990s. Some of them already had children. Some of them hadn't even begun to start families. All say they were either tricked or didn't fully understand the consequences of what was being done to them at the time. 
but they live with those irreversible consequences to this day. Concepcion Alcahuaman was unwell with a swollen gallbladder. In 1997, she traveled to Arequipa, the nearest big city, to have it surgically removed. Under a local anesthetic throughout the operation, she claims she watched as the surgeon cut her fallopian tubes. Unlike her companions, she had no children before the operation. She says being childless has destroyed her home life. Ni siquiera con mi esposo vivo bien. Estamos un poco o sea, alejados, alejados. Ahorita tampoco no está acá. Mi esposo está en Arequipa. Cualquier rato, cualquier hora, cuando le da la gana se va. Como no tiene hijo, entonces no, no, no tiene cariño para mí. Así, por ese, por ese causa de Puji Moré, yo me encuentro así, sin apoyo, sin nadie. O sea, the so-called reproductive health program was implemented by then President Alberto Fujimori, now jailed for corruption and crimes against humanity. But he's never been tried for the alleged forced sterilization of tens of thousands of women. At least 18 women are known to have died from complications arising from the surgical procedure. Fujimori claimed he wanted to cut the birth rate from an average of more than 3.7 children per woman and sterilization was voluntary. But witnesses say doctors and nurses were given quotas and even offered bonuses for every woman they sterilized. As the head of the Medical Doctors' Union in Pura in northern Peru in 1997, Dr. Hernando Ceballos defended colleagues who refused to take part in the program. The Ministry put plazos, plazos, that is, for example, 150 to 200 people have to be captured to be sterilized this week. For this, there were some incentives o darle, por ejemplo, algunos equipos a los establecimientos para que puedan funcionar, o algunos premios ¿no? al personal que llegaba a estas metas o que superaba las metas. Y por supuesto, para esto se hacían especie de festivales para facilitar la captación de las pacientes. Zivayos, now a congressman elect, says the forced sterilizations may have happened more than 15 years ago, but the impunity surrounding the case is as present as the Fujimori name in modern Peruvian political life. The jailed former leader's daughter, Keiko Fujimori, lost the presidential elections by the narrowest of margins. In a speech at Harvard University late last year, Keiko Fujimori said individual medical staff were responsible for the forced sterilizations. There have been various investigations in different governments. And these investigations, what they signal es responsabilidades personales en los médicos que cometieron, que no respetaron estos protocolos. Yo condeno la actitud de estos médicos irresponsables. Y como mujer y como madre de dos niñas, me solidarizo con todas estas mujeres. Y aquellas que han sido dañadas tienen que recibir una reparación por parte del Estado. Pero como mujer también creo que tenemos el derecho a tener la información de decidir cuándo y cuántos hijos tener. But Zavallos maintains that it was not the actions of individual doctors, but a state policy. Es tan falso esto que existe documentación. Hay documentación muy clara, firmada por los directores regionales de salud, donde solicitan que se cumplan las metas. Presentamos una denuncia a la fiscalía porque se pretendía, mediante documentación, 
este, que en ese establecimiento se realicen cerca de 300 esterilizaciones, intervenciones de AQB, en, los, en el lapso de menos de una semana, en casi un fin de semana, cuando ese establecimiento no tenía capacidad ni siquiera para atender a las pacientes que daban a luz de manera normal. The longtime front runner Fujimori lost the elections by less than 1%. Huge protests against her presidential candidacy highlighted issues like the forced sterilizations. Protesters pointed out that Keiko had served as her father's first lady from 1994 until he fled to Japan in 2000, from where he resigned by fax. Han pasado más de 14 años y no hay ningún responsable, no hay ninguna sentencia, no hay ningún culpable, no hay preparación para las mujeres. Creemos de que las esterilizaciones forzadas, eh, el caso de esterilizaciones forzadas, tiene un tinte y un sesgo, aparte de machista, también racista. Eso cree, por eso creemos que principalmente no es un tema de agenda nacional. Las personas no reconocen eso como un crimen de lesa humanidad. In 2074 cases, women testified that the procedure had been done against their will. A criminal investigation on behalf of those victims has been reopened to include Fujimori, his health ministers, and other health service operators. Han pasado cerca de 14 años. Ese es un caso que, a pesar de la gravedad y, digamos, lo odioso de, de, de los detalles del caso, eh, es, un, es un caso que también ha tenido resistencias eh, para los Fujimoristas en general, los, los partidarios del, del señor Alberto Fujimori. Este es un caso muy sensible, es un caso que los vincula con graves violaciones a los derechos humanos, pero que eh, ellos han alegado no haber cometido, y, a pesar de las pruebas contundentes que existen. But after a long wait, forced sterilization victims are, for the first time, being registered in a national database. Cusco's public defender, Roberto Chavez, told CCTV officials in his region had logged hundreds of victims. This process of inscription generates three rights. The right to health, which is through the inscription of inscription in the register of health, a benefit economic o sea que es una atención gratuita, ¿no? Asimismo también eh, el, el derecho a un tratamiento psicológico, ¿no? Eh, a través del Ministerio de Salud, ¿no es cierto? Y de parte de nuestra institución, el Ministerio de Justicia y de la Defensa Pública, la atención legal en cualquier otra materia o asunto legal que la víctima requiera. Most of the women just want the recognition that what was done to them was wrong, as well as financial compensation. But it cannot undo the past says Felicia Mamani. Ni, ni siquiera la indemnización que con el tiempo nos pueda dar, nada nos va a aliviar, porque nosotros así moralmente siempre vamos a estar heridas, resentidas. Nosotros necesitamos un tratamiento psicológico constantemente, porque una sola vez, ni siquiera una sesión completa nos va a hacer, ni así el daño va a estar reparado, el daño ya está hecho ya. Years have passed for the forced sterilization victims to be officially recognized. Meanwhile, the long walk for justice continues. Peru's most senior prosecutor has asked for a new investigation into the case. It could determine whether health ministers and former President Fujimori can be prosecuted on human rights charges for implementing the forced sterilization program. Coming up. A woman helping Mexican children growing up in prison. They've never seen what society is like. So we help these kids have the tools that they need in order to be successful in life because they still have their whole life in front of them. America's Next. Welcome back to America's Now. In Mexico, there are currently hundreds of children who are born and raised in the prison system. For the past three years, a Mexican NGO called Reinserta has been working with these children and their mothers to help improve their living conditions and prepare them for a better future. The organization's director, Saskia Nino de Rivera, is this week's Game Changer. For the last 
couple of years, Mexico has had a really bad problem with organized crime. And the fact that Mexico's prison system doesn't work does not help Mexico to get better because the prison system is the last chance that we have in order to give opportunities to the people that have given their life to the organized crime. And if we don't see our prison system as a place where we could help these people come out of that kind of life, then Mexico's security problem is going to be worse every time. My name is Saskia Niño de Rivera. I'm 28 years old, and I'm founder and director of Reinserta. Reinserta is a nonprofit organization that works inside Mexico's prisons. We try to bring society and real life into the prison. <laughs> So when I started to live what a hostage negotiation is, I started to understand and try to be really intrigued what, what is happening in our country and what is happening to a person that he feels that he can take someone, put him inside a little room, maybe mistreat him harshly because he needs money or he wants money. And the first time I went into a prison, I turned around and I said, this is it. Like, these people are miserable. This is, this is, this is not a readaptation re center. This, this is a criminal university. Like, this is crazy. And, and I started to listen to these people tell me their stories and they told me what they went through. And I'm not justifying the fact of what they did. I don't. It's just we have to understand what they're going through and what has taken them to the point where they have no empathy for someone that they're doing such horrendous things. Reinserta works with children that are born and raised in Mexico jail system. A lot of people don't know this, but Mexico has, by law, um, children that live inside these prisons. Because these children, most of them, have never been outside the, the prison, right? So they've never seen a car, they've never seen a dog, they've never, they've never seen what society is like. So we help these kids have the tools that they need in order to be successful in life because they still have their whole life in front of them. from being with their mothers 24 hours a day, they go to see their mothers one time, once a month. So when this separation occurs, it's very traumatic, not only for the child, but also for the mother. So we have to start working on that months, maybe a year, before this occurs. Ese es un encontronazo de vida porque es el motor principal de, de, de nosotros como pareja, el de mi mamá y el de mi hermana, ¿no? Y entonces el hecho de prepararlo, de decirle, ya no vas a estar aquí, o sea, no, no hay palabras que tú le puedas decir a un niño, ya no vas a estar con nosotros, porque él es lo único que conoce, ¿no? Su núcleo familiar está aquí. Tuve la fortuna de, de, de encontrarme con Reinserta México. Me ha llevado a poder tener a mi bebé a, este, aquí y de mostrarle a mi bebé que no solamente es esto, ¿no? Eh, que, que hay cosas, que hay personas, que hay colores, que hay números.
Mexico when uh, a teenager has done a crime, he goes into, inside the, the juvenile system and when he comes out, he has no opportunities. He goes back to his life. So Reinserta has created a model that is sort of like a halfway house where we try to work one-on-one -on -one with these kids and help them get back into society in a positive way, crime-free, drug-free way. Uno cuando sale de esos lugares se encuentra sin nada. O sea, estás en el nidito, ¿no? Sales y te encuentras desprotegido, no sabes qué hacer y aparte como ya estás como fichado, pues no es tan fácil que encuentres trabajo, sales sin papeles, la mayoría sale sin estudios, sin apoyo familiar. Como el documental que y entonces ya darte como el dinero, como a ver, y te van a grabar un estudio y todo y te montan sí, un sí, ¿no? Empecé a diseñar y pues, hice playeras, o sea, ahorita apenas ya las concluimos ya impresas y con lo que es el empaquetado. El ver ahí plasmado tu esfuerzo es algo muy agradable y muy satisfactorio, ¿no? Saber que lo has logrado. Sí. Cierto, sí. Lo que quiero pues es este, terminando la prepa, meterme a estudiar criminalística. O sea, después de lo que me pasó, como que ver la injusticia me motivó mucho eso. Obvio que en el país está difícil, ¿no? Pero yo creo que un pequeño granito es el cambio. And I love helping people that no one ever turns around and sees because we judge. And if that person's created a crime, we never say why did that person create a crime or what happened to that person in order to create that crime or to do that crime. So if we understand that, we work in prevention, but you also work with a, with a group of people that normally no one works with. So it's very gratifying and I love it. Reinserta is working on a proposal to lessen the amount of time children spend in the prison system from six years to three years. This would help integrate them into society earlier and better prepare them for the future. We'd love to have your input, so if you know someone who's helping change the world, drop us a line at an at cctv-america.com or tweet us at cctv underscore America and tell us about a game changer you would like to see on America's Now. Coming up. A Chilean wine tour reveals the region's petty heritage. Lo que nos inspiró es que, bueno, llevamos mucho tiempo ya en China. We were inspired when we saw an increase in the consumption of imported wines. People started having a different conception of wines. Reason to drink wine changed. The middle class started to expand, and there was a trend towards consuming more healthful products within the alcoholic beverage category. America's Next. Welcome back. Krug, Dom Perignon, names that are synonymous with fine wines and champagnes are increasingly popular in China, to the point where the owners of Moet has started producing their own luxury brand of red wines there. Ao Yun, made in Yunnan province, goes for 300 euros a bottle. But the fascination with red wine in China doesn't end there. Wines from Chile are experiencing huge growth in China, making trade ties between them even stronger. America's Now correspondent Harris Whitbeck reports on the Chilean vineyards that are reaping the benefits. He's been surrounded by grapes and wine his entire life. He speaks of his family's vineyards as if they were his most precious offspring. Sebastián de Martino is passionate about his family's organic winery outside of Santiago. Now 
las primeras nevadas de, la, de los Andes empiezan a caer y hacia el otro lado tenemos eh, el mar. Por lo tanto, estamos situados en un lugar más cercano al mar que nos permite tener un clima que es eh, templado, templado cálido, que nos permite crecer estas variedades con gran éxito acá en, en, en Maipo. He delights in the mineral qualities of the earth, the mix of cold air from the Andes and salty breezes from the Pacific that conspire to help create beautiful wine. And he is discovering that passion is being stoked across the Pacific. Like many Chilean wine producers, De Martino is seeing a sustained and growing interest from China in the red wines he produces. While they have been in the market for years, Chilean producers have seen a surge in the interest of Chinese consumers. No, lo que nos inspiró es que, bueno, llevábamos mucho tiempo ya en China, pero lo que veíamos es un creciente eh, consumo de vinos importados al país. ¿ah? Una, una mirada eh, distinta hacia el vino, hacia lo que es el aspecto de, del consumo, las ocasiones de consumo, eh, se, se fueron variando y se fueron expandiendo. Una clase media creciente que tiene otros intereses, eh, una orientación hacia productos más saludables dentro de lo que, la categoría de, de alcoholes, por supuesto, que es el vino y en especial el vino tinto. Y en todo esto realmente Chile eh, con una percepción muy favorable eh, desde los consumidores. Por lo tanto, estábamos absoluta y estamos absolutamente convencidos de que tomamos las decisiones correctas. Siempre uno hubiera querido invertir más y más temprano eh, pero creo que el momento fue muy apropiado, formamos una, una empresa, una oficina eh, en que los recursos locales son, son muy muy fundamentales, es una, una empresa local, eh, con gente local eh, que nos enseña ¿no es cierto? Eh, cada día más acerca de los canales, de las potencialidades. Es un mundo que cambia todos los días en China, pero con nuestro equipo allá, con nuestros tentáculos digamos ahí eh, y con el compromiso de la compañía estamos cada vez entendiendo cómo crecer, cómo capitalizar y cómo construir marcas, que es lo que es nuestra ambición, construir marcas en, en, en el mercado chino. Casillero del Diablo, produced by the famed Concha y Toro Winery, for many it is Chile's most emblematic export, a hearty red wine that is as much about the legend of its origins as it is about its depth and flavor. Eh, lo que tiene eh, de fabulosa la marca Casillero del Diablo, es que es una marca, yo le llamo un True Winemaker's Brand. Es una, es una marca que tiene el heritage, la historia, que habla de la historia de la compañía, en que nuestro fundador, don Melchor, guardaba sus mejores vinos, y ustedes van a tener la ocasión de ver la bodega Casiero del Diablo. Y él escondía ahí sus mejores vinos, y como era muy característico en la época, inventó una leyenda que el diablo vivía ahí. ¿eh? Y de hecho le pagaba a algunos trabajadores para que hicieran ruido, y bueno, quizás se apareció en más de alguna ocasión el diablo, pero tiene la leyenda, tiene la historia, pero muy importante lo que está dentro de la botella, es, está lleno de integridad, está lleno de calidad, y, y eso es lo que creo que nos diferencia eh, con, con otras marcas, ¿eh? porque tú puedes crear marcas de la nada, puedes eh, inventar marcas, pero esto es una marca que, que viene de una realidad de la compañía y además se logra eh, eh, ofrecer calidad y a un público masivo a precios muy convenientes. Entonces esa mezcla hace de Casillero del Diablo una marca global presente en 150 países. Last year, China consumed 90,000 bottles of Casillero, and that figure continues to grow. China is Chile's most important trading partner. While copper is by far the main export, red wine is proportionately not far behind. In 2015, Chile sold close to $250 million worth of red wine to China, a 40% increase in sales over 2014. Much of that wine, about $57 million worth, was sold in bulk so that local distributors could market it under their own brands.
The industry accounts for 600,000 jobs in Chile, and it is so large that it has propelled Chile to the number four spot among global exporters of wine. The Chilean government wants that trend to continue. Roberto Palva is in charge of that effort as head of the Chilean trade office. Nosotros creemos que tenemos un, eh, un gusto distinto. No es eh, sustituto el vino chileno, el vino francés, del vino argentino. Un Malbec argentino es una maravilla y un Bordeaux francés también lo es, un Bourgogne. El vino chileno tiene eh, otro espesor, otros taninos, otra fuerza. Es un vino que tiene mucha fuerza. Tal vez, esto es una hipótesis eh, de trabajo, con los alimentos chinos, que son alimentos densos, son alimentos fuertes, la, 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 la comida china es una comida de mucha fuerza, eh, el, el, este, vino, este vino chileno con más taninos, con más fuerza, ha caído muy bien. Eh, esa es una hipótesis de trabajo que la vemos en muchos mercados. No somos eh, sustitutos de otros vinos, somos un complemento de, de la mesa de, los, de las familias chinas. Es un esfuerzo de ProChile y de los empresarios. Eh, ProChile es una bonita alianza público-privada. Nosotros le transferimos fondos eh, mediante concursos, ferias, al sector privado para promover el vino chileno en el mercado chino. Pero los empresarios han sabido aprovechar, ¿ah? eh, eh, han sabido desplegarse, han sabido cuidar el mercado chino con eh, productos de buena calidad. Ensuring that continued growth requires special knowledge of the intricacies of the Chinese consumer market, one that is rapidly changing as the Chinese middle class grows and becomes increasingly sophisticated. I think it can be a change gradual, but very quickly. I remember from seven years ago when I involved in leading this area. It was my first trip to China. It's another China. It's other realities. It's other diagnoses. And los que yo pueda transmitirte brevemente hoy día van a variar el día de mañana. Producers, larger commercial ones like Concha y Toro and smaller ones like De Martino, say their quality will help counter the complexity of the market. For Sebastián De Martino, it is about wines with a strong heritage, like this one, which is fermented in clay vessels that are literally hundreds of years old. Lo que tenemos acá es, eh, son tinajas, son más o menos las que tenemos en esta sala, son 80 tinajas más o menos, las cuales eh, corresponden a, los, a dos vinos que, que nosotros comenzamos a hacer hace más o menos seis años, uno que se llaman los viejas tinajas, tal como el nombre del, del recipiente. La tradición en Chile cuando llegaron los españoles y plantaron las primeras vi, viñones en este lugar en 1551, era hacer vinos que se fermentaban y envejecían en estas tinajas. La tradición casi se perdió durante la, en nuestra historia y años atrás tratamos de regresar al pasado y, y buscar nuestro origen al, al tratar de hacer un vino como se hacía antes. Y estos vinos que, que se hacen acá son vinos muy especiales que nos conectan con el pasado, que nos conectan con nuestra historia y los orígenes de la viticultura nacional. Y son eh, muy, muy especiales. Comenzamos con 14 tinajas, hoy por hoy tenemos 140, ten, tenemos algunas guardadas al lado que no estamos usando porque no hay muchas tinajas hoy en día. Al perderse la tradición y al distinguirse, ya no la hace. Y las nuevas que se hacen son, son buenas, por ejemplo, para maceteros, cosas así, sí, no pero, pero no para vino. Claro. Y estas las rescataron ustedes, las fueron... Uno por uno rescatando. Sí, entonces tú ves que lo, son de distintos tamaños y formas también. No hay ninguna que sea igual. Or Casillero del Diablo, which evokes the strong character of its founder and of the earth it comes from with every sip. Todo vino parte en el terroir, en la tierra. La elección de el terroir adecuado para las uvas es, es clave. Y Conchitoro ha invertido apasionadamente, diría yo, no solamente racionalmente, pero muy apasionadamente, en todos los distintos, por ejemplo, desde el norte, Limaría, hasta el sur, en Bío Bío. Entonces, eh, tenemos una variedad eh, eh, muy importante, pero además podemos controlar la calidad, porque son viñedos propios. Los que no son viñedos propios son contratos de largo plazo, eh, y no voy a entrar en, en mucho detalle, pero son contratos que siempre están al servicio de la calidad, es decir, recompensan, bonifican a ese eh, 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 contratista, digamos que está, a ese productor, perdón, a ese productor, que sigue los estándares definidos.
Quality and tradition helping to create a new brand of wine drinkers across the sea. Since China is already the world's largest market for red wine, producers around the world are looking to break into the growing and lucrative group of red wine lovers there. Coming up. A chocolate boutique with sweets almost too exquisite to eat. Really from an early age, my mom kind of impressed upon like me the importance of some of these indigenous and ancestral foods, particularly chocolate. I think it's like a point of pride for a lot of Mexicans that, and Latin Americans um, that chocolate is really native to the region. America's Next. Welcome back to America's Now. Chocolate has been around for 2,000 years. It originated in Mexico, but consumption of it began as a drink, and it wasn't sweet, but bitter. The Aztec and Mayan civilizations believed it was good for their health. Legend has it Montezuma, the Aztec emperor, drank 50 cups of chocolate a day. Spanish explorers brought chocolate to Europe in the 1500s, but it wasn't until the 1850s that the idea of eating chocolate began. In England, chocolate houses were gathering places like pubs or coffee houses. Today in Washington, D.C., there is a chocolate house as well, but it's a shop. For this week's Urban Voice, we introduce you to one of the owners of the chocolate house, Marisol Slater. Tucked away in a corner of Washington, D.C.'s trendy DuPont Circle neighborhood lies a tempting treasure, a sweet retreat called the Chocolate House. Marisol Slater is one of the store's three current owners. The shop was opened about 10 years ago. Um, it was opened by a gentleman who was a flight attendant and traveled all around the world and he loved to buy different chocolates from every place that he was stopped while he was flying and that was sort of his idea for the shop was kind of like like a wine shop but for chocolate almost all of the cacao producing countries in the world we have a bar or a product from which includes most of latin america so mexico guatemala el salvador dominican republic cuba Haiti and into Ecuador, Venezuela, Panama, Brazil. Some countries have bigger production right now than others. Do you guys have any questions? Like the cacao tree, Marisol's roots are planted in Latin America as well. My mom is from Chiapas, Mexico and, and grew up in Mexico City. Um, I was born in South Carolina and really from an early age my mom kind of impressed upon like me the importance of some of these indigenous and ancestral foods, corn, um, uh, different fruits and then particularly chocolate. I think it's like a point of pride for a lot of Mexicans that, and Latin Americans um, that chocolate is really native to the region, it's native to the Americas. A lot of people don't know that it's an agricultural product, that it's like coffee. It grows, um, and it grows in the global south, 20 degrees north and south of the equator. Most of the world's cacao comes from small farmers, so it's not these big, huge agro-farms like palm or banana. 80 to 90 percent of the world's cocoa is grown um, and harvested by farmers who have like 25 acres or less. Always think about like Belgian chocolate or Swiss chocolate, but Europe gets its reputation for chocolate from production. Um, it has it has produced chocolate since cacao was brought from the Americas to, to Europe. And the Europeans found out all these different and super creative and, and ingenious ways to add sugar to it and add milk powder and make you know bonbons and confections. So that's where their expertise comes in is in production. The 
Chocolate House features creative flavors like whiskey pecan, cherry blossom, champagne, and passion fruit. Some look too beautiful to consume. What's the most popular flavor? We sell a lot of salted caramels, which I believe is probably a huge trend for all chocolate makers. But in terms of bars, we really try to promote our local makers, people who are doing um, the whole process themselves from bean to bar here in the, in the area. Um, and those tend to be darker chocolates, so 70%. And the more people kind of learn about chocolate and taste more chocolates, the more people gravitate towards some of those darker chocolates. A lot of that flavor and aroma and depth that you would find in a really fine wine. We have um, a number of bean-to-bar makers, and those are people, when we say bean-to-bar makers, those are people who start with the the cacao bean um, and then roast, grind and, and turn it into a bar. And then we have a number of chocolatiers and chocolatiers are people who take the final, the finished kind of chocolate product like a bar or chips of chocolate and they melt it down and they turn it into these like beautiful painted filled chocolates, confections, caramels um, and things like that. Twenty sixteen marked the year the Chocolate House sponsored Washington, D.C.'s first chocolate festival, a chance for people with a passion for chocolate to meet the makers. How are you guys doing? We're killing it. Like this is all we have left. Amazing. Yeah, it's like awesome. two hundred bars gone. Good, 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 good. Yeah. That's yeah. really, really good news. Yeah. We are super happy with the turnout. We were a sold out event and I think almost Everybody has come and claimed their tickets. We're really pleased. We have a lot of local uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia makers today. That's who we reached out to first to support and kind of invest in the festival. And then we have some international makers, Picari from Ecuador, Diestro, El Sable from Bolivia. Bakari means nature in uh, Quechua, which is the Indian language of our land. It also uh, means new beginning. So the founders like this word because they said we we have to start the chocolate business as a, as a new beginning and also let the world know that the best cocoa doesn't come from Europe, it actually comes from our country, from Ecuador. In Ecuador we have about 20,000 people that depend on cacao growing that work for us. We have about 23 different bars, but then we also have some fruits covered with chocolate. There are five types of bars, but we also have 100% cocoa powder. It comes from the co-op in Bolivia. These trucks are taking the beans of the chocolate, of the El Sabo chocolate, which is 100% organic, all the beans are air dried. They don't go into oven, so it's pure, pure. And it keeps all its nutrition, all its caffeine. Once those beans are dried, they, go, they have to go to a processing plant. And since the beans are grown on the east slope of the Andes, on the skirt of the Andes near La Paz, they have to travel on what's generally known as the most dangerous road in the world. These trucks cannot pass and usually, especially when it's raining, they have their own protocol as to who has to stop and back up to go to the, to the little area where they can pass. And sometimes they have to wait a day or two if, 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 uh, if the mountain falls on the road. But it it's just goes to show you what all the co-op has to go through to get the chocolate. Back at the Chocolate House, Marisol and her partners okay. offer tastings and classes to the public. We do a basic tasting class and we do a basic truffle making class. And the basic tasting class is kind of your introduction to chocolate from start to finish. We really want to be more involved uh, with, with small makers and with farmers. So for us, it will be great to use kind of our platform and knowledge about chocolate to reach out to more farms around the world, particularly in Latin America, 
um, and try and get those farmers connected to makers or uh, distributors, um, importers who can use their beans and um, kind of increase their uh, ability to, to take this amazing plant and make it their livelihood. The pods of the cacao tree contain 40 to 50 beans each and are surrounded by white pulp. It takes about 400 beans to make a pound of chocolate. America's Net. Finally, we take a look at urban gardening in Venezuela. Residents are encouraged to grow fruit and vegetables on their balconies or in the garden as a way to deal with food shortages. The homegrown foods also help reduce living expenses. We leave you with images of city farming in Venezuela. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week for another edition of America's Now. Estamos sembrando aquí hojas que tienen alto contenido de hierro y de otros minerales que nos sirven para completar la mesa. Realmente nosotros no estamos sembrando aquí para llenar el estómago, sino para alimentarnos mejor. cosechamos y cultivamos en nuestras propias casas. No viene nadie a quitarnos eso, ni nadie nos lo va a vender, nosotros mismos lo tenemos. Lo tenemos nosotros mismos y ya ahí, ahí abaratamos el costo de la vida. El, el, el tomate que tenemos que jalar a jalar, mucho para las hamburguesas. 